Brenda has to, oh, there she goes. Okay, so we'll call the meeting to order at 4.01 p.m. Um, subject to the law passed and signed by the governor on June 16, 2021, this meeting of the City of Gardner School Building Subcommittee will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. For this meeting, members of the public who wish to watch the meeting may do so in the following manner by watching it on the City of Gardner YouTube page. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so, despite best efforts, we will post on the city's website an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive recording of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. Um, Dr. Hemming, can you call the roll? Yes. Uh, Mark, Pelle Mark Pellegrino, I know he's not present. Wayne Anderson here yet. Uh, Bob Hankinson. Present. Jennifer Flavin. Present. Bob Schwartz. Yes, present. Mark Clark. Present. Mayor Nicholson's not here. Alan Minkus, you're present. I'm present. Uh, Margo Jones, I don't see. Christian Winsett. Present. Uh, Brenda Smith is present. Am I correct? Yep. Brenda? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Matt Dunn? Present. Josh Cormier, I know he said he might not make it. And then Steve Hemmen. We do have a quorum. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to approval of the minutes from the July 14th, 2021 meeting. Move, move to accept the financial subcommittee meeting minutes of Wednesday, July 14th. Second. Second. Bob Hankinson. Uh, motion made by Bob Schwartz, seconded by Bob Hankinson. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, we'll put the matter to a vote. Uh, Dr. Hemmen. Can you call the roll? Yes, I can. Uh, Bob Hankinson? Yes. Uh, Jennifer Plavin? Yes. Bob Schwartz? Yes. Mark Hawk? Yes. That, that's it. Those are the, we have four votes for the president. Oh, Wayne is now Wayne. here. Okay, Wayne, uh, you want to vote to approve the minutes, Wayne? You're, you're, you're muted. Sorry about that. Yes, that's a big yes. Okay, thank you. We have a vote. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Um, approval of bills and orders. We have a bill from Allied Testing. The amount of money is, uh, it, it, the invoice number is 22810 and it's $3,055. Move to approve, Hankinson. Second. Uh, motion made to approve the bill by Bob Hankinson and seconded by Sh Bob Schwartz. Is there any discussion? We lost you, dear. She became frozen. There is no discussion on the matter. That's the way she just went off. Well, is, is there any, uh, and we still have a is there any- Oh, uh, all right, I'm back. Did I, okay. did I cut out? <laughs> yes, yeah. Don't want to lose you. Um, okay. So I, did you guys vote? I didn't hear. Not yet, no, I'll take it. Uh, Wayne Anderson? Yes. This is voting for the Allied uh, invoice. Bob Hankinson? Yes. Jennifer Plavin? Yes. Bob Schwartz? Yes. Mark Hawk? It's a vote. He okay. affirmed, shaking his head. Okay, we got it. Okay. Uh, moving on to the report from the OPM. I am waiting for Tim to jump on. I He has the report. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm here, uh, Alan. Oh, there you are. Okay, I see you now. Um, okay, so um, really what we wanted to talk about are just our um, finances um, and we have a number of PCOs to, to go through. Um, You're going in and out, Tim. Pull up our... Um, our budget, if you need to close my, um, turn off my camera so it would be more consistent. Uh, let me try that. I believe everybody we sent out yesterday, the uh, notes on the PCOs, everybody received those okay? Yeah, I got them. Oh, 
Is Tim frozen? I think so. It does look that way. Frozen. Um, Christian, do you want to move on to the change orders then? Sure. Yeah. Um, that narrative that we put together has actually been in the short time since we emailed it to Steve, um, updated to include four more items. So um, I'm happy to do this anyway. We could do an overview, which is typically what Tim would kind of present on how we're doing overall, but maybe we should just dive into the details and then we could pull back to the overview afterwards if that works for everybody. So why don't I share my screen if that's okay. It looks like I can. can folks see that? So this is what, uh, the same document that you should have received from Steve. And here, I'll blow this up a little bit. Um, I'd uh, like to make a recommendation. Sure. PCO uh, 66.1 and 90. I would like to have that as a separate discussion. That sounds great, Wayne. I think that's, uh, that's that seems a great idea. Um, Maybe we could do that at the end and go through these other ones in, in the meantime. Um, I, I'll just roll through these very quickly since you guys have already seen this, but uh, thermal breaks is one that we've been talking about for a very long time. Um, we did get approval for not to exceed for 20,000 and it came down to 17.2, um, which is uh, you know significantly lower than the original starting price at 39. Um, so we went and, approval. Well, hold on, hold on. Um, Chris, excuse me. Have you spoken to Tim this afternoon? I have not. Okay. Um, I did a review of that and I see it being more in the neighborhood of twelve to $13,000 from what I can see. So maybe it's something we think about, you know, this, if we get approval here, it's a not to exceed of 17, 215 and we make an attempt Sure, Matt. Well, we already have approval for not to exceed 20. So if we want to go back again, we certainly oh, well, we can to push push bacon a little harder. But I think since since Tim can't get on, I think he would be uh, maybe saying that we're not going to approve it yet at 17, 215 or, you know, on our end of it. OK, great. Um, so it may go down. That, yeah, that's your worst case, 17. Great. Um, Next one is uh, 45, and this one was one that we received quite a while ago. It was changed for the acoustical decking. Um, we reviewed the price and we really did not have issue with the amount of acoustical decking. There were some ads and some deducts, but they had a pretty outlandish price for installing uh, acoustic bats inside of the metal deck. This is up on the top of the third floor. So we pushed back on bacon. They were using the roofer as a filed sub to do that work. Um, they decided to self-perform that task at a lesser cost, so it came down to 4393. Um, 63 again was already approved at a not to exceed of 17092. And since then um, we uh, pushed back on bacon and it's come down to 10,862. Um, 66, as Wayne uh, mentioned, maybe we can talk about at the end. So I'll pass over that one for now. 77 is another one that um, I'll kind of pass over. We rejected this on July 20th um, and Bacon has not really responded to that rejection on the 20th. It's still listed on their PCO log, so they're still keeping track of it, but they haven't really issued a formal response to that rejection on, on the 20th. There's a very large one on 82. Um, we wanted to bring it to the attention of the committee. Um, everyone's working very hard to reduce this substantially. Um, so no action needed at this time, but we wanted to at least put it on the radar. Um, yeah, again, I, th I think all parties are, are looking at different ways to reduce that, including bacon. So um, we'll stay tuned on that one. Uh, could you go back for a minute, Christian? What is that sure. all about? Added CMU lateral bracing, what is that? Yeah, so there were some details on, um, this is bracing the top of the CMU walls um, to, the, to the deck or to the structural steel above it. Um, and uh, there were some details in the bid documents um, 
Bacon claims that it was unclear on where those applied to. And again, they interpreted the documents very specifically that it only happened in very specific places and not the rest of the building. Um, and so then they applied that same, they were kind of complicated details and they applied that same complicated approach to the rest of the building. And that's how they came up with this number. So we're pushing back both on where we think we own it in the construction documents and where we don't think we own it. And then we're also changing the approach substantially on how this work gets done, trying to simplify it. So that's how we're hoping that the, the cost will come down. Does that help a little bit? Yeah, that's fine with me. Okay. Um, 85 is changes to the kiln. Um, this was a add for uh, the power needed to the kiln um, from what we had in the construction documents, but then a deduct for a slightly smaller kiln. And we checked with the art teacher and this one will still be um, quite substantial and bigger than any we've put in, uh, in any of our other schools, um, our electrical engineers as well, but still meeting the needs of the school. And so it's a net savings. Um, of 1,500. Did I see you go by 83? 83 is on the list that you sent me. Did, that was a reduction. 83 has since been voided, Steve. That was the um, that was the uh, welded wire mesh, I'm pretty sure. Yes. So that was an issue where they couldn't get the right material. So they were offering us a small savings um in the long run they were able to find the material after all and so they have voided out that pco okay i'm just that did go out to the committee that's why i'm picking up on it um 86 is a plumbing and kitchen equipment coordination item um, again some ads and some deducts um, for for plumbing changes um, with the result being a change of $2,079 or $2,079. 90, again, as Wayne mentioned, we'll discuss at the end here. Um, a credit for a spray air vapor barrier. This is a fluid applied air vapor barrier instead of a, a kind of a sticky sheet good. Um, and we pushed back and thought that the credit should be a bit higher. They described the, the additional um, labor. Uh, they have to caulk all the joints before they apply this fluid um, air vapor barrier. We talked to the building uh, commissioning agent about this um, and he actually kind of prefers the, the fluid applied and had good luck with it, both with the same contractor and the same product at the uh, Templeton project. Um, and so we recommend uh, taking this $12,000 credit. Uh, adding a microwave to the administration suite, that was just after more discussions with the district. Um, so we had to change some power and change a little bit of casework. Uh, comes to $2,142. Increasing the elevator pit depth, this is again where we see that uh, bacon leaves no PCO unturned. Uh, perhaps another GC would have just swallowed this, but uh, the submitted elevator does require a slightly deeper elevator pit than what we had in the documents, so a change of $550. Can we uh, go back to that? I understand the uh, the pit's already been dug in the walls, or the yeah, the walls have already been made. How do you go about digging the hole deeper when the walls are already there? Yeah, I imagine, Bob, that they've already done the work and technically they're not supposed to do the work until the PCO is approved, but um, in an or attempt at their to own keep risk. project moving, they've, I think they've gone ahead and taken the risk and oh, done okay. the work correctly. So we could essentially tell them to eat it. We could, yes. Um, ceiling trim, this was another coordination issue of we just dropped a portion of the ceiling in the uh, third floor hallway of the B-Wing um, for $614. Um, AED cabinets, these are the um, uh, defibrillator cabinets. Uh, we're going to have three of them in the building. Um, originally, we thought they would be owner supplied and we'd take them from the old schools and put them in the new school but it just works out much better to have three new ones. It also um, 
meets ADA requirements that they not bump out into the hallway too far. So these are semi-recessed cabinets. Um, so this is an ad of $1,232. Um, how do we, did, how was it determined that the building only needs three? I think we had a few more originally. Again, they were all owner supplied, but uh, I think Wayne talked to the nurses and that's uh, what they landed on. I think they're all gonna be in the kind of the central hallways of the B wing. So centrally located and one on each floor. One and the one on the bottom floor is right outside the nurse room. So it's both near the nurse and the uh, gym. Yes, that is, uh, I spoke with uh, Becky McCaffrey regarding the AEDs in the locations and she recommended they be basically stacked one on top of each other. So they'll be in the central core, floor one, two, three, in a very similar location. We are using or reusing the AEDs that will come out of Waterford and Elm Street School. Oh, okay. This is just for a semi-flush cabinet to uh, reduce any uh, issues with ADA compliance on the width of the hallway. Okay, thank you. Um, 104 are some sprinklers to a C-wing soffit that got a little bit wider than uh, the code maximum for the width of a soffit before it needs sprinklers inside of the soffit itself. So a change for 3,560. Um, <clears throat> balancing valves again for hot water, uh, plumbing coordination, um, some adds, some deducts, and the result is a, is a net add for 3,963. 106 is kind of a large one. This is again, one that we're not bringing up. We're not recommending for approval tonight. Um, this was a request that, you know, they thought that the culvert had to be longer than was included in the bid documents. The design team and Colliers feels that um, it was really a coordination issue. Uh, we didn't know exactly what type of retaining wall uh, they would choose to use. And so we indicated that the culvert needed to coordinate with the um, the batter of the retaining wall. Um, and so we're, we're pushing back on this one. Uh, 107 is the uh, poor stop placement at the, it's uh, stair two. It's the bottom of the stair as it goes from the third floor down to the second floor. So it's the slab of the second floor. Um, and it just needed to extend a little bit further uh, in the field once we saw where the anchor bolt locations were for the bottom of that stair. Um, so adjusting that poor stop placement is $2,240. I do want to give some credit here, especially to Matt, who um, helped uh, and, and Bacon figure out how to reduce this cost because they were first looking at it and it was more of like a $7,000 cost, which was uh, a little bit ridiculous. Um, stair one landing supports. Um, this is one that has already been approved by the mayor because Bacon um, asked us to approve this um, as quickly as possible. It was a, uh, an issue in stair one where we have a, a concrete masonry unit stairwell um, and uh, we had rods hanging down supporting the stair uh, and it was gonna work out much better to have em embedded plates in the CMU, but the uh, mason needed to know that right away. Um, and so this was a, uh, a change to make stair one function and, and be structurally supported in a much cleaner fashion. Um, and that was a change of $9,465. So those were all included in the Word document that was emailed out to you. Since then, there's just four more I'd like to go through. Uh, one is a deduct, this first one, 111, door hardware changes. Uh, this is a a uh, deduct of $4,106. Um, I really have to give um, credit to Wayne for this one. So he really went through the documents with a fine tooth comb and reviewed all of the door hardware. Um, we had had discussions with the district and the police and we had you know, long ago thought that the uh, doors between classrooms, the communicating doors should each lock from both sides. Um, and after you know a bit more time and reviewing that and thinking about it, both the district and the police decided that that was no longer necessary. Um, in some cases, they felt that it was even safer to not have that at all and just have a passage set there. 
So that's where the majority of this deduct change is coming from. Um, and uh, we had a great discussion with our consultants, our hardware consultants, our security consultants. I know this is a sticky issue, so we wanted to make sure that everyone was on board. Um, and they all said that, yes, districts do it both ways, um, and it's about 50-50. Um, and so this, this seemed like the best way to go forward. So that's a, a savings of 4,106. Um, condensate drain, I'm actually gonna hold on this one. Uh, our mechanical engineer is reviewing um, it is a change that needs to happen, but they were looking a little bit more closely at the unit price um, for getting that drain to a, to a different room. Um, a different case of CMU wall bracing. So uh, this is um, at the second floor of the C wing. And this is the one location in the project where we have uh, concrete masonry unit walls going up and then our ceiling or our roof structure, because it's a gable roof, is so much higher than those CMU walls that we're just stopping the CMU walls uh, about eight to 16 inches above the drop ceilings. And then from there, we're gonna diagonally brace it to the, um, to the deck and to the, to the structure above. Um, we had indicated it on our drawings, but we had not called out clearly enough on who exactly should own it. Um, so uh, this is the um, light gauge metal framing filed sub bid, taking a look at it um, and uh, offering to do this work for $15,633. Um, the benefit of them doing it is that they'll we'll still be able to snake all of the HVAC through there, um, but uh, a way to brace the top of those walls for uh, that location in the C wing. And then finally, one that just came through today, um, this does not have a PCO number to it yet, um, uh, but we've been talking to Bacon about an additional flow test needed for the um, fire protection sprinkler system. So we did a flow test two years ago now, um, which is hard to believe, but that's uh, when we did it and um, so we did two different flow tests, one off of the um, Catherine Street and one off of Pearl Street. The assumption was that uh, the water would come from both Catherine and Pearl forming a loop and that we would do a test at the school site um, during construction. And that would be the responsibility of the um, fire protection installer that filed sub bid. Um, and the name of that company is SRI. So that's what we thought would happen, but it took until about a week ago to realize that um, the road from Pearl Street will not be done um, to the point where they're able to bring water up to the site until about December. Um, and so we have water coming from Catherine Street, um, but really we were relying on the larger main that's going down Pearl Street uh, for this, uh, for our um, fire, prote fire protection sprinkler system. So in order to not wait until December, um, because we need to do these calculations to size all of the piping so that the um, uh, sprinkler guys can get in there and start installing their piping right away. So um, for a minute, everyone thought we'd have to wait until December, but the, the better solution was to test the Catherine Street and the Pearl Street at exactly the same time. And if we're able to test them at exactly the same time, then our um, fire protection engineer can do calculations, figure out the um, you know, topography and can calculate what the pressure should be once that loop is created. And we can size all of the sprinkler piping based off of that. Um, we're still requiring that SRI do a final test once the loop is created, um, but we need to do this kind of um, intermediate test um, as soon as we can um, so we can do those calculations. So. Our fire protection engineer is gonna do one of the tests off of Catherine Street. Um, SRI is gonna do one of the tests off of Pearl Street. This is the cost for just SRI to do their portion of the test. Um, our fire protection engineer gave a quote and I can pull it up, but I think it's about the same amount, a little bit less maybe. And um, that will be a reimbursable service. So that's kind of wrapped into a different portion of the bill um, and we have 
uh, room in our budget for that. Um, but this is just for SRI's portion of the sprinkler test off of Pearl Street. So now that Tim's back, he can tell me what I got wrong in all of that summary. But if there's any questions or uh, like specific to, numbers I should pull out, please uh, please let me know. I'd like to add to the, uh, the additional water supply flow test that the uh, David Wood, the original person who did the uh, flow test in 2019 in SRI have been outstanding with trying to resolve this and get this thing moving in to keep us on on uh, schedule. So I mean, 10 grand, yeah, it hurts, but it, it's I feel it's really short money and they've been phenomenal about, you know, trying to work up, trying to come up with a solution to keep this project on schedule without and uh, the building commission and the, and the fire chief are going to accept the uh, stamp drawings from David Wood once the tests are complete. And they, uh, David Wood is assuming, and I agree with him, that the uh, flow test will be better than originally anticipated because of some restrictions set forth by Suez in 2019. That's all I have to add. Thank you, Wayne. I, I agree. I, I've been, they did a great job of reaching out to, to Wayne and to, to Dane at the Water Department and, and problem shooting this one. Um, who's can I just ask, though, whose decision was it not to bring the water until that time, though? Until it, December? It's a good question, Jen. Basically, um, Bacon feels like it's it would have been impossible to bring the water any sooner than that. And that's because of how the phasing of the project has gone. Whereas right now they're focusing on that driveway to connect to Catherine Street. They're almost done with that. And as soon as they're done with that, they're gonna demobilize from there and go over to Pearl Street. But over on Pearl Street, they still need to install a culvert over that um, wetland area there, import a bunch of fill, you know, so that they have a lot of work to do over on that Pearl Street Drive. And so with that, phasing of you know preserving access to the site from Pearl Street now for all the contractors going up and they're going to switch over they'll work on that Pearl Street Drive the site will be accessed by all the construction workers from Catherine Street um, and because they couldn't do both of those drives at the same time this summer uh, that's how it had to go so they chose the phasing of the project too though Yes, that it's that's the tricky part, right? It gets into uh, it's definitely their phasing, and their argument is that it was impossible to do it any other way because they set it up that way. Right. <laughs> I would say originally, you know, that was our first thought was that um, the coordination issue on their part, but there were. The other aspects of the Suez, the I guess they were the managing your your water system um, in the past, uh, putting restrictions on what types of tests could be done. So this this test of both hydrants at the same time, had that been done um, originally during design, um, we might be in a different position now. Um, we were only allowed to test one at a time, and then they got some strange fluctuations in the in the results. So. Um, doing this now, it, it's like a lot of these things. There's some, there's definitely gray area on this. Um, but I think the, the design team, the OPM, um, and, and I don't want to, put, to speak for you, Wayne, but I, I think we're all in agreement that this is something that, um, that we should process in order to keep the job moving. There's, there's enough kind of, um, issues to go around uh, on this one. Yeah. I agree 100%, Tim, and uh, we believe part of the flux, uh, pressure fluctuations were coming from uh, where they put their pressure meter at the middle school. They basically put it on a, uh, a dead end uh, hydrant loop that goes in front of the middle school and continues around back to the kitchen, which would uh, produce some fluctuation. And the DPW director said there were other issues going on in the city that could have uh, 
impacted the pressure fluctuations and it was a uh, it was a pretty good swing of 15 psi per you know one way or the other so i mean it's definitely going to impact the pressure rating and the flow coming out of middle school Uh, Christian, uh, I think we're done. We should, we're, Wayne has to go to 66 and 90. And uh, before we begin that, I want to let the committee know that um, on the 26th, I guess, July, uh, an email was sent to Wayne and myself indicating that on these two ECOs that they were sort of a deadlock with the architect and the OPM. Um, really, it's going to send it to us like that. Uh, when I received it immediately quoted it to the architects and to the OPM, we had a meeting on Monday and then bringing it forward to you now. Um, Wayne and I are the decision makers, it's the, it's the building committee, the subcommittee. So I wanted to know that we had major discussions. And I'll let uh, Tim and, uh, and um, Christian uh, continue with those. Why don't we do 66 first? And I think make some comments to them that it's really inappropriate to send the letters like that to us, asking us to do something about it. Um, thanks, Steve. Christian, I'll, I'll let you um, start off with this. You did such a great job with all the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> but then, um, then we can kind of go through a little bit more discussion. Um, Sure, this is one that I think the, the subcommittee is unfortunately already familiar with. Um, so this is uh, perimeter angles at the sea wing roof, um, as you can see here, uh, first came in at 26,000 then down to 24. We rejected it in the middle of June. They provided that narrative on July 12th. We met as a subcommittee shortly after that, I think on the 14th um, and decided to maintain that rejection so we responded on the 20th, telling them that and that they should keep, they should proceed with the work um, and that they do it under protest if necessary. And then Bacon provided this letter uh, to Stephen Wayne on, uh, on July 26th. Um, this again kind of gets into, it, it's all unfortunately gray areas, but, um, you know, Bacon is claiming that uh, they did not know that the perimeter angle irons were necessary at certain portions of the sea wing roof. Um, our response is, look, we showed some type of angle at every single architectural detail, whether it was the A wing or the C wing, which both have similar types of roofs. Um, every single architectural detail shows an angle at the end of the eave. Um, Every single structural detail also shows an angle at the eave. Unfortunately, the structural details call out specific locations. And again, that's because they were dealing with different steel heights. And so they say, you know, steel height should be 1186 at line C6, and it should be 1187 at line C7. So Bacon and SBL are claiming, well, we didn't know what was happening at line C A because that wasn't covered in the structural details. Um, we disagree just in the fact that there's, no, there's never a detail presented where this perimeter angle is not present. You know, if there was some confusion over, oh, these types of eaves have them and these types don't, um, we could understand. But um, so that's why we rejected it originally in June. Um, I, th I don't think the argument has changed over time. Again, Bacon is still claiming, well, the architect architectural drawings reference the structural drawings. So therefore we go to the structural drawings and the structural drawings only show certain column lines. So therefore we only applied it to those column lines. So um, that's kind of a, a summary of the argument. Uh, I would add um, that during the bid process, there are a number of questions that come in and um, you know, we, we do a, we respond to those questions or the design team responds to those questions, but we do put a deadline on when they can ask questions um, so that it gives the design team time to respond uh, prior to bidding. You gotta cut them off at some point. 
Uh, one of their arguments is that, well, we had asked some questions, um, we got these responses that showed angles and showed the, the size of the angles in the A-wing. So therefore we carried the cost of those in the A-wing. Um, so they're acknowledging that in one hand, they're saying that, hey, they got this information really late in the game. Um, and they didn't have the chance to follow up with another question about the other wings. But that's admitting that they got the information, they saw the detail, they saw what it was, what it should be, and that they had applied a price to it. Um, if their follow-up question was, hey, is the, the steel and the detail in, in these other locations the same thing? Um, maybe we could have answered that, but as part of the general conditions, they do own what's on the document. So then what they have to um, carry is a cost for something in kind or something similar. You can't just say, well, we're gonna do that out of a one by one aluminum angle. It has to be something that's structural steel because everything else in that area is structural steel. Everything else in the, where you do know what it is, is structural steel. So therefore we're saying that real, look, you may not have known exactly what it was, but you should have a, a cost, a, a placeholder for something. You had, you had to put in something, you can't just ignore the detail. Um, and right now we're not getting anything from them um, to show that, hey, okay, well, we carried a something, a two by two angle or the cost of something else. So um, we feel that it's shown in the documents, we own something. There may be, may have been some confusion, but we think there, this one is kind of a stretch where they're, um, they're asking for it at the very end um, because the information was provided towards the end of the bid period. So I just wanna make sure I understood that. So they asked about the A building that has the same exact thing as the C building. They got the answer on A and didn't apply it to C because they didn't ask about C. Does Close. that make sense? <laughs> yeah, well, they asked for a question and the response was a detail which referenced the A building because the A building has different roof line elevations, different heights. And so, um, in response to that, they just assumed that that only reply, only affected the A building and didn't really take it to the next step, assuming that the B section of the building or the C section of the building would be covered as well. Okay. I'm still a no. Uh, providing more information from uh, what Tim has provided, the, uh, the documents that Bacon had submitted to us. I mean, at some, I would like to uh, to discuss what's the the chain of events. Like, I appreciate you guys looking out for us and the, you know rejecting this PCO. But at the end of the day, as an owner slash city of Gardner, we are responsible and this could go to arbitration. So that's, it's, I don't know where your responsibility ends in the city be begins. And I'm just concerned about protecting the best interests of the city. So well, I think that's a good, a good point, Wayne. I think maybe we should talk about this in conjunction with the other one. And then the same solution and where you're going with this might apply to both. Why don't we go ahead and move to 90s? 90. Great. So this is a similar issue. Eh, yeah, similar. Uh, so this is relieving angles for the B wing. And, and I've just pulled up our exterior elevations here just to, sometimes it helps to visualize this. So let me. Um, so wherever we have um, three stories of masonry. Um, we need to have a relieving angle to um, carry, uh, to help support that height of brick. So uh, this is the A wing here in this uh, image right here. And so this whole portion here, uh, the, the brick doesn't go all the way up to the third floor roof. And so there's no relieving angle required in that area. Um, this portion over here, it does go all the way up to the roof. We have brick all the way to the top. 
So we included a relieving angle and it's called out uh, right here, masonry relieving shelf angle with thermal break by structural steel. And it's this dashed line that comes across right there. So in this particular case, we have a section of the building going through right here. And so when you go to that section, you can see that detail of this is a piece of steel that's coming off of the structure at the floor of the third floor and helps support all of that brick that's above it. Unfortunately, we did not take any sections through the B wing where this is also required. So we have this masonry leaving shelf angle with thermal break by structural steel. And this is that line here, again, where we have three stories of brick all the way up. So it doesn't happen in nearly as much of the B wing as it does in the A wing because we don't have as much three story of um, masonry walls. Um, so again, in our details, uh, it, said, it references that A wing because that's where the section is taken through. And so um, Bacon is claiming that uh, the relieving angle was never detailed at the B wing. All details of a relieving angle reference the A wing and therefore they do not own any structural steel for the relieving angle at the B wing. We responded that we don't agree because it was shown what we think is relatively clearly on the exterior elevations. Yes, all of the details did reference the A wing, but we don't have any other type of relieving angle anywhere else on the project. Um, and so they should have assumed that it would be the same detail at the B wing as it is at the A wing. Um, this one gets a little bit more complicated because it gets into that thermal break portion of it. Um, and we have since agreed that that was not clear in the construction documents. So we rejected it outright on June 28th. Um, they responded with their uh, narrative on the 12th. In our response on the 20th, we said, uh, okay, we think that we do owe you some money for the thermal break portion of this detail, but we do not think that we owe you any money for the structural steel portion of this detail because that's all detailed out, it's covered, and we just didn't happen to take a section through this area of the building and that's not, you know, that's no fault of the, of the design team or the client. Um, they didn't seem to accept that argument. And so they sent that letter to Stephen Wayne indicating that they think they should get paid for um, both the structural steel and the thermal break. So adding on to uh, Christian and Tim. Uh, so addenda seven in the pre-bid process was issued two days after the question and answer uh, deadline, therefore eliminating any chance for follow-up, and I'm not trying to defend Bacon or anybody else, uh, any follow-up to this question. So in my opinion, we own it. And, you know, this is a chapter 149 hard bid job. And anybody that's going to make assumptions is not going to have much work. That's unfortunately that's the way it goes. I mean, if we, if there's things missed, I mean, to say somebody can make a placeholder and nothing against him because I would do it because I did a lot of, all, all I did was private work, but in public work, you can't leave a placeholder. If we leave something that could be, we can't leave any assumptions on the table is what I'm getting at. And to assume that any contractor is going to carry something as an assumption is, uh, I don't consider that, you know, sound break business practice on their part or anybody's part. Well, I think one of the things is both of these, we've got to make a decision. You're talking 50 some thousand dollars that they really are sending the letter to us and everything. Um, 
and I think Christian explained it, Tim's explained it, that both sides looking at the some issues. Probably got to make some sort of a, an agreement with them and move forward. I would like to uh, add the uh, that I, after an hour of probably an hour of deliberation between all of us, between Collier's, Christian, myself, you, Steve, that I'm a bottom line guy. At the end of the day, uh, we're going to win this in arbitration. And Alan said, there's no way. And it, and it goes back to receiving the information two days after the question and answer deadline. So well, it's just it's it's just the question deadline, not the answer deadline. Yeah, the question deadline. So that could arguably, I'm sorry to put words in Alan's mouth, they could argue the fact that we did not give them a chance to follow up with a question. Is that better, Tim? I, I think Wayne, you captured it perfectly that that in my experience, and I was in private practice for 40 some odd years, that uh, an arbitration board listening to this and listening to the way they're they're laying out their argument would say that they did not have the proper time to uh, get further questions in and that the documents were nebulous um, in their responses. Um, and I, I think from my experience, uh, an arbitration board would, would uh, side with Bacon on this and um, we'd lose the argument. Um, it just, that's my opinion. Yeah, Christian, I have a question for you. Is um, was the relieving angles part of Addenda Seven, or just the um, um, just the uh, the thermal breaks and the a you know the the uh, I'd have to look back. To the de the detail that clarified the relieving angle was part of Addenda Seven. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't know, Alan, I've not been to a board of arbitration. The only thing I would disagree is that we run into this on every project is that you have to give the deadline for questions. You have to then get out your answers and then you have to wait two days to get the bid and that's mass general law. And we followed that timeline. Um, and it's okay. always the case that there's questions that you wish you could have answered a little bit later. Um, I don't know if there's any way around it. Otherwise, the dead, the bid deadline would just extend on and on and on. I, I agree. I agree that it's not ideal. Yeah. Like certainly, this whole process was not ideal, and and in hindsight, we probably should have extended the bid deadline by a week. I, I, so I'm, I'm going to go a little bit further, Kristen, and just basically say that we're all very much aware right now that uh, a lot of the issues that have arisen right now in change orders or PCOs have been tied to structural documents. And, and I would say that this, that, that would lead into the decision by the arbitration board mm -hmm. that, that the documents are, were lacking um, in, in the coordination with the architectural documents. And um, I, I would recommend that we, we take the, this combined $50,000 and we try to negotiate with Bacon for reduced price to settle this thing and keep the project moving so that it's not something that's hanging over our head for the rest of the project. And, and then it gets trumped up by, you know, whether we have lawyers in there or, or other people in there that are, that are costing more than the negotiated price to settle this thing right now and move on. Um, and hopefully this is the end of it now that uh, we're, we're, we're getting to the end of the structural steel portion of the, of the work. I would, Madam Chair, I would suggest that the architect and the OPM go back to uh, Bacon on these two and see what they can negotiate and come forward at the next building committee on the 18th. Yeah, I just, is there any other discussion from anyone else or any other thoughts? Just continue with Alan's uh, sentiments. I mean, the total right now is 56,956. I believe we should go back and negotiate. Having been through arbitration in my short time with Gardner Public Schools, it's not it's not cheap. So this 56 could be become 100 easily. And it's not in the best interest of the city. I mean, I'm almost at the point now to say, give them the 56 grand and let's just move on. I know that's not the right thing to do. But it's at some point, you know, the momentum of the job is going to be lost. 
and it's going to be, we're still a year out and they've done every contractor, the design team, Collier's has been great and they've been moving this project forward and to get hung up on 56 for $57,000 on a $90 million project seems kind of ridiculous at the end of the day, the being truth be told. And you may disagree with me. It's just our drawings were lacking and this is the price we got to pay. And and Wayne, th thank you. We need to move on right now. Madam um, Chair, I'd make a motion to uh, have a not to exceed price of the 56, whatever the total is and have um, Collier's and uh, whoever else go back and negotiate, try and get it less. Okay. Is there a second? That, a second. that includes the team Collier's and Jones Winship. Thank you. I have and a second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, we'll put the matter to a vote. Mr. Hammond, I mean, Dr. Wayne, Hammond, call the room. Wayne Anderson? Yes. Bob Hankinson? Yes. Jennifer Plavin? Yes. Bob Schwartz? Yes. Mark Hawk? Yes. It's a vote. <clears throat> Um, Madam Chair, I would suggest that the uh, you've gone through all of the uh, these PCOs and that I think we've had to come back uh, for a meeting on the building committee with a, a completed uh, change order number six with all the things in there. Right, but do... Oh. Sorry. No, go ahead, Christian. I was just going to pull up a draft of that so people could see. So okay. this is all of the kind of small, the, the line items that we went through. And again, some of these uh, were approved previously. This does include the thermal breaks that Matt mentioned we might try and uh, push back and, and see if we can get that down even a little bit more. But from the thermal breaks, the acoustic decking, the deduct for the spray, air vapor barrier, sprinkler sewing soffit, um, uh, the 109 that was already approved by the mayor, the door hardware changes, including the flow test, uh, this PCO comes out to $61,332.67. And looking at our previous PCOs, um, you know, just so that we have an idea of where our total is, that brings our total of all PCOs up to $584,000, um, which is just under 1% uh, of the uh, contract price. Uh, Christian, I would suggest that the two things we just discussed, the 56,000 be, be on a change order number seven, not on this one. That sounds great to me, Steve. And you could bring, so that, for, we could bring that forward to the committee on the 18th. Great. And that, that, those are not included so far in, in this total here, just right. to be clear. Okay. So we need a motion to accept. So Take motion. We need motion. A motion made by Wayne Anderson, seconded by Mark Hawk. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, Dr. Hammond, can you call the roll? Yes. Wayne Anderson? Yes. Robert Hankinson? Yes. Jennifer Plavin? Yes. Bob Schwartz? Yes. Mark Hawk? Yes. So that, that's, that'll be coming in at the 61,000, or if there's any adjustment downward, that'll be at the, uh, the uh, committee on uh, the 18th as well as number seven would be settling the issue of these last 66 and seven, 66 and 90. Okay, so moving on, we don't have any old business, no nude business. Is there any it, other? Uh, oh. yes. yes, we do. Um, oh. Yes. Um, did you have something, Matt? Oh, yes, I was going to mention uh, if we wanted to talk about the unsuitable soil, at least let them know. Yeah. Have a... yeah. Okay. Uh, the other day, the Monday, um, Marais, the contractor, encountered some more unsuitable soil at the top of the access road to Catherine Street, right when you come off the pavement to start going downhill. We're about 100 feet long and pretty much the width of the road and the sidewalk. Uh, apparently, it was used as an, uh, another dumping area for um, fell. It was a lot of rocks and a lot of loamy kind of organic material. We brought the, the uh, geotechnical engineer out and he agreed it was not suitable for use under a road. Um, 
we, in the prod there, in the geotechnical um, OTO and Fuss and O'Neill, the civil engineer, are working out a solution. Uh, but right now, what they're considering is some kind of soil stabilization fabric about four feet down, um, and then building it up with good material from there, which the project would have to pay for. Um, it would be a best way to do it again, like the other one would be on a time and material basis, uh, which by the way, just to let you know, the other unsuitable material, most of it, once we separated the rocks, was able to be lost on site right in the vicinity of the retaining walls. So that worked out to our benefit. Uh, however, with this one, there is no more room for that sort of thing and it will have to be removed from the site. And I just wanted to give you a heads up. Um, it, it could be every bit of 50 grand plus. Uh, we don't know the exact numbers yet or the exact depths, but uh, you know, we basically once, assuming with the next day until we get guidance from the engineers, we'd like to be in a position to be able to uh, have the team give direction to Bacon to move forward on preferably a TNM, which is the best way to track this. Um, but we wanted to maybe get it not to exceed approval or something along those lines. Was this, uh, Tim, I mean, not Tim, Matt, this was part of PCO 84. This is like PCO 84 2.0 was the uh, original. Well, yeah, but I, it'll have its own number. I don't believe there's a number assigned to it yet. It'll be 110 or 111 or something like that. Did the committee approve anything for PCO 84 for a time of material? Because I think you indicated that there was some time and material cost already incurred. Yeah, uh, not, I believe they had given us a fifty thousand um, dollar not to exceed and and be able to you know proceed on a time and material basis, which is what we're looking for here. Here, just the dollar amount is a little bit higher, as best we can estimate. You know, because we don't know the quantity exactly, and that's the hard part. Exactly, the. Uh, DPW has already committed to uh, a rough 5,000 yards of material that they can accept at their gravel bank. So I would recommend that the committee approve this in a type of material basis and to uh, basically remove any material and uh, bring it to the city of Gardner's gravel bank on Templeton Road. Is that what it is? Which is less than two miles from the and site. And by the way, that's what the way I, that's, uh, excuse me, in the estimate, it did include bringing it there as opposed to bringing it someplace where you had to pay to get rid of it. But it included the trucking time, you know, back and forth to Templeton. Yes, and that site is uh, less than two miles from the school building site. Okay. Well, what are you recommending at this point? You want to not to exceed number at some point to the time and materials, and then we're still going to have to write up another change order to put, document that both both of these things have to be done that won't happen until after all the work is done and we they've tallied up all the various tickets we've signed so now we, we got, we're going to have two two of these things going one was the previous unsuitables and now a second one yeah and the, this one the first one for the most part is basically complete it's just not all wrapped up uh, you know, summarized in time and everything yet. Do you have an anticipated cost? Up. Matt, do you have an anticipate uh, a rough cost on PCO 84? I think it could be twenty twenty five thousand dollar range under the 50 for sure. But again, I haven't seen all the paperwork yet. Yeah, I mean, this is an unforeseen condition. And I just think we have to go for it. I mean, maybe the uh, whoever built this, the high school in 1976, they foreseen this condition. So we're stuck with it. And um, unfortunately, it is that and all the work that comes behind it, such as the communication duct bank and water main up to the site, are basically sort of critical path items that uh, 
bacon is really, you know, hot to get going because they're already, you know, standing around waiting to do this, waiting for an answer. So it's something we, we need, do need to resolve. Agreed. So, you know, at least. So what would the estimate be for this one, though? What do you want not to exceed what? 75. That high, Matt? Sorry? How much? 75 yeah. what? 1,000? 1,000, yes. <laughs> I'll make a motion to uh, not to exceed 75,000 for whatever this uh, change order is going to be. I'll second that. And it's just, yeah, we just really need to get this thing going. I mean, they should start hauling material. If they could start hauling tom material tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock. That would be too late anyway. But yeah, I second it. Uh, motion made by Mark Hawk and seconded by Wayne Anderson. Is there any discussion on the motion? Real quick follow up for maybe Matt. Um, yes. Would it make any sense for any of this material to be screened on site so we can have a uh, you know a good loom pile up near it's the high not, school? Or? It's not the kind of loam no. that you would want to use. It's more organic. It's not. It's not what what you would find for the first six eight inches below the grass. It's not that kind of loam. It's, right. it's more of an organic powdery. Even when you pick it up and try and crush it, you try to make it like a snowball, if you will. It just falls apart. It has no cohesive value to it. So it's it's organic. But okay. And that's something they'd have to do. They have to bring in a, a machine. And the more okay. they handle it, the more expensive it gets. Okay. And logistics of trucking it on site to the main part of the site, it, no, that wouldn't work out would not be of us to do that. All right. Okay, any other discussion? All right, Dr. Hammond, will you call the roll? Wayne Anderson? Yes. Robert Hankinson? Yes. Jennifer Clavin? Yes. Bob Schwartz? Yes. Mark Hawk? Yes. It is a vote. Okay, so do we have anything else to come before the committee? Yes, we do. Um, one of the things we we had a conversation during the construction meeting today is, is, is the payment schedule. Um, the last six months, things have been going well, I thought. Um, however, when we had to push it on the June 30th date to get things in quickly because of the change over the fiscal year, now they're saying they're not getting paid behind. Um, and so maybe wanting to look at changing the uh, building committee, maybe be the second uh, Wednesday, and I, we don't know any conflicts, and then the subcommittee, the fourth Wednesday of the month. Uh, suppose that might be easier for them to get the, the bills in, and we can uh, check with the um, uh, uh, warrant schedule. I've asked uh, the new uh, Deb, uh, um, um, Eileen Bristol to send that to me before we do it, but I want to take a look at it so we can get in. Now, an example she gave me today is when I sent down saying that you approved the one for vacant. You're not going to start going to hit till the 19th for two weeks, so we really got to look at this again. I don't know what's mess I don't know what's messing it up, but I want to look back at it again. But at least alert you, we might need to make a change so the timing is it works for them. And she was concerned about that the subs are saying complaints are not getting their money. So I don't know, Tim. You, Tim, you weren't at the meeting. Uh, I don't know which Christian or Alan. You want to add anything? Yeah, I guess well, I'll just say our thought was that the school building committee is, you know, we want to make sure that they're approving the bacon invoices since they're so large. And the thought was that by having the school building committee on the second Wednesday of the month, it just gives us a little bit more time to review their pencil rec, their pencil requisition, it's called, and then their final requisition um, and process that well before the school building committee. So there's not quite so much pressure at the end of the month to do that. And then at the same time, that would process everything a week earlier than we have now. You know, right now we'll we'll hopefully approve their bill on the 18th with the school building committee. So, if we were to do the second Wednesday this month, for instance, it would have happened on the 11th, and then they would get um, paid a little bit faster. I've got to take a good look at the schedule that when the Eileen sends to me. Look at that schedule and make sure what's the timing. So, I just wanted to bring that to you. Mike, I, on, the, on their bills, I think it needs to be approved by the full committee. Your job, what you're doing now, is dealing with the um, with the change orders, which is appropriate. That's why we set up the finance subcommittee. Uh, but when you're talking a couple million dollars, I think the full committee needs to do that. Now, 
in an emergency type, we have the authority, given the authority to approve bills if necessary. But I think it really goes, large bills really need to be at the full committee level. Steve, uh, we do have a, a requirement um, for two weeks after the architect certifies the uh, requisition for payment that um, the city make payment within that two week period. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and that, that's what we're trying to get straight. Uh, you, thank you for saying that. We're trying to get that so it does work. That we got to look at. I don't know. I can tell you, the last year they when did, they came on what eight months ago, and the timing we haven't heard a complaining about it. So I don't because know they haven't gotten their recs in on time. So they've been yeah. getting their pencil recs in a little bit late. They'll, they'll wait to the end of the month to submit their pencil rec. Um, and then it gives us time to pay by the, or to, to meet and discuss it with the full building committee at the third um, third week of the month. But um, now what they've done and really what is required by our contract is that they submit a week before the end of the month with an anticipated completion amount of work completed that we review so that, that by the end of the month, the rec can be finalized um, and then you have 14 days from there to pay. So we can we can kind of work this out a little bit, but um, yeah, we may need to adjust a little bit. So we'll be back, we'll, we'll talk with the uh, team and we'll be back to you on what we see, what's the best way to do it. Okay, is there- I think that's all we have at the moment. Okay, so moving on, um, public comment. All right, doesn't sound like anything. Um, next meeting dates. So we're just gonna keep this being the first yeah, of the be, month. It would be September 1, would be the next one. I, the fourth I didn't put up, it'd be September 1, it would, we would be meeting then. Okay, and there's no need for executive session, so we're in line for adjournment. So move. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank Aye. you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thank you. Have a good night.